Uh, I'd like for us to get uh, started uh, as punctually as possible because we have a full schedule today and we want to try to move ahead so that everybody will have an opportunity to enjoy what we hope will be some sunshine at the end of the day today. So my name is Denise Caldwell. I'm the Division Director of the Physics Division at the National Science Foundation and I'd like to open this session this morning with our first talk uh, from uh, Professor Jose Onuchik from Rice University who's going to speak on the three-dimensional architecture of the human genome understanding the physical mechanisms controlling gene expression. Okay, uh, first as uh, the last organizers join Herbie and Kristen later, I want to thank everybody for having joined us here at Varna and thank you for coming. It has been a great conference and I, I, I enjoy having you here. And also, good to see a full room of courageous people in the morning. Uh, so, this is a collaboration that starts with our, in Houston, you heard a lot about ARIES yesterday, but there has been something at the center that's going for some time. I think we have uh, here people, the postdocs and students have worked on it. I, I, several of them are here. Vinicius is here, Wei Chi is here, Ryan Chang is here, and Dana is here. They're going to talk a bit. A lot of the work here talk today is work done mostly uh, by uh, Michele and uh, Ryan but I would recommend you to have a look on the poster by Dana on our structure of condensing and cohesin. And you're going to see there's not exactly a donut, and also there's the idea that's probably one loop and not two loops. So to go there is going to be an interesting story for you to see on have time to talk today. Uh, repeating what everybody said, I want to remember that basic people, everybody said the chromosome is two meters long, but it has to fold into a nucleus at the interface of about six micrometers, right? So it's an amazing thing. And one thing has been discussed for a long time, basically, Sasha Grosberg is here, is that this thing has to fold, if not forming knots, forming very few knots. So that has been one of the challenges in terms of getting that structure and to understand. And as we know, it's not a structure, it's an ensemble of structure. And uh, actually, Peter later today is going to talk about dynamics of it. So in a sense, the, the tendency is to think about it, the, your chromosome as being a polymer, but this polymer is actually a very complex polymer, as you have heard from everybody else. You have all these interactions with transcription factors, enhancers, putting things together. So the interactions are not direct interactions between beads, but are mediate interactions between beads. But it's more than that. It is a very complex polymer. In a sense, that the beads are not that simple. They're not just like your amino acids that come together, but uh, you're composed by nucleosomes that have histones, and uh, these histones can get modified, and a lot of the interactions are very epigenetically dependent. You have heard a lot about it, so that's something that when you do build your model, that has to come into, into the model, okay? And as all people said, I'm going details, there are two ways that people have been investigating the structure of this system, or at least of this ensemble, that's having a look either by fish, or variations of it, as we have had many variations of it, or by this conformation Detection techniques, as you heard, lots of talks, particular Aries gave a great talk on, on, on high C. But one thing I want to put when we are building a model for these things, all this is, is the following situation. When you look at high C data, here's a particular system of high C data of interaction between two chromosomes. What you observe is there are patterns that get formed. There are different patterns of interactions. And if you go around and do some machine learning and clustering of these patterns, Depending on how many interactions you have, you also heard that from Aries, I'm just presenting with different words. You try to figure out how many different patterns you have, and when you do this situation, you come to these classes and subclasses, or types and subtypes, what he called A and B, and actually you have a, A actually falls into two sub -sub subtypes, A1 and A2, and B falls into four subtypes, B1, B2, B3, B4, and you have these things. But the beautiful part about these things that just come from a structure, by looking at this conformation is if you compare to modification to histone and you have these antibodies, things identify, you observe that these patterns have lots of relationships between the chemical pattern of histone modification and the structural patterns that come here. So there is the idea that the structure is related and a lot of the types and these different classes that are put here, classes or subclasses, they are related to the chemical modification of the histone. 
And here is just sort of curiosity. You also saw some of these things on the talk of Aries yesterday. Here is a particular piece on GM12678 that's basically a lymphoblastoid. And here's another cell, a pulmonary cell that is a fibroblast. And what you observe is that these patterns are very different for these two cells. Although the DNA is the same, the patterns are different. They both say that the structure depends on the type of cell, not on particular DNA. So you have to take that, or that all into account. And then also summarizing what you heard yesterday, this is the same figure here. You start to see that from these patterns is associated to some uh, phase separation, or basically different types tend to accumulate with themselves. So in a sense, what that's saying is that A types tend to phase separate with A types, B types tend to phase separate with B, uh, with B types, and then you have the subclasses that also phase separate, but they are sort of uh, A1 prefers to be with A1 and A2, but A's prefer to be A's with and B's. So in a sense, the A and B classification is a good one to just describe the problem in general, because it's sort of you can talk about this idea that A's try to phase separate from B, but you have this sort of subclass that come into the system. So what I'm going to present today is the model we try to say, can we use this information? So when I'm done on this presentation, I will have to say to tell you that if I get a particular cell and I know all its chip seq information, all their modifications, from that information, I can identify these types. That means by A's and B's or subclass A1, B2, B3. And from this sequences of A's, 1's, and B1's, and B2, I can predict the three-dimensional structure of the system, or the ensemble of structures of the system. And, uh, and like I said, on this talk, I will focus on how do we look this ensemble of structures, and I'll let Peter in the afternoon tell you about how this particular Hamiltonian you're going to be developed, or this model you're developing here, is also can produce a dynamics that's, that's similar to dynamics we have talked about the subdiffusion that we have heard about for the system. But, I'm, but this you, you get all in the afternoon. Uh, just highlight what I just said, you have to remember the associate to these maps. You're not talking about a single structure, you're talking about an ensemble of structures, right? The tendency of people that are like us, that have been working on protein folding for a long time, and other people in the structural biology, is to believe that you're going to have a very nice single structure. When you look at dynamics of the system, they are very viscoelastic, and they are very, and so it's, it's, you really have to talk about an ensemble, and that's something to keep in mind as we come along. Another thing about high C is that basically, as you try to convert to these contact maps that you have here into a structure, you're going to need a function that tells you what, if I have a contact, what is the distance between these, these beads that we have here, okay, as we build this polymer model. So this function, we treat the sigmoid function, that's a function that people have used experimentally. We use a similar function. We have calibrated that mostly from fish data. That's the nice thing. From a few contacts from fish, you can have. So you're going to see that our model, you're going to have a situation where a bid, in, in this case, the model I'm going to present to you, is about 50 kilobases. So remember, it's a very cross-graining view. That's on the early data we have, 50 kilobases. And when you calibrate these things, I'll, I'll show some data later on, this give about 0.16 micrometers for the size of these beads when you calibrate. So you try to come to a size, uh, our simulation this is going to be an average This, but the size of beads goes on this situation. So in the end is, if you have that, that means you try to get this structure from here and you invert and you try to get the structure in three dimension. Now, if you're going to build a model, what do you include into the model? Basically, should I just consider a homopolymer? So the early stages, you think about a homopolymer. We have a homopolymer model, very simple one, just as where sort of uh, in terms of uh, basically beads and springs. But more interesting on this model is that it's a soft, is a soft polymer in a sense that we allow in some crossing between the chains because we have top isomerization into the place. In our most of the simulation, we show you this probability of crossing comes with a bear of about 4 kT. But you can go into the model and actually change that number and figure out what possibilities of crossing is. So that's a possibility into this model. But that's an interesting thing to come into, into that discussion as we're going to discuss time scales into the system. But what we put in the top of this homopolymer picture, the first thing I tell you, as you said, is the idea that you have these structural types, the A's and B. So into my model, I have to include the possibilities of having structural types. So I'm going to put that into my model. 
Okay, and like I said, these structural types are not so easy by looking like protein photons and just look to kinds of amino acids because you have to take that you have this implicit protein model of saying, but it's not a protein, it's a DNA, but the idea is it's not just you can talk the beads as being the series of amino acids, they may depend on epigenetics, right? Depend on, on the medium that they are, they're, they're present. The fact number two is you have loops. Here we include the CTCF loops that comes from areas. That's the second part you can put into your system, okay? And the third term, is a term that actually started when Bing Zhang was around with Peter Wallens, is the idea that uh, there's not only the first term is spatial interactions. You're talking about things that are coming close to each other in space. Right here is talk about base things that are in terms of genomic distance, is how far they are on the chain from each other. And what you observe is there's a tendency of very strong interaction between beads that are close to each other. Here, in a sense, we go about uh, it has a chain dependence, we call gamma D, tend to be very strong on the first five, uh, up to five, but it has, can go longer into the systems. And what happens is, as you know, these local interactions tend to give this sort of helical kind of formation for the system to come together. So this is a slide I stole from an early paper from Bing Zhang. Actually, this is more into the limit of the ideal chromosome alone, and, I, and my thought looks like that. If you just have this gamma D term, you tend to form the systems of helixes of helices. Uh, in the interface, you don't see this very stable helices, but you have the tendency to form them. So in my point of view, that has not been proven, but it's a good argument we are trying to work on it. This tendency of putting local structures is also one of the reasons that keep nothing to be formed. If you try to form more local structures, it's more difficult to, to have nothing, but that's something that has to be quantified better. I present you just more as a sort of an observational evidence, but it's something they really want to work on, on quantifying these things better. So these are the things that you have. What do you do if you're a physicist? You have the information, I want to throw that into the model, and in a sense, we get this sort of what we call our effective protein model. This is the first paper we published on it. There was a nice commentary written about it. I want to make the analogy between the two things and try to talk, talk about loops as being disulfides and uh, types as being amino acids. But I want to point out one thing that's very important. Proteins have real structures in most cases. Here, you really you have an ensemble of structures, and that's one thing we do before. So what's the game here, being a physicist, now to build a model? You do what we do in everything. We have these observables, like I told the three physical assumptions, context, loops, and, uh, and the ideal chromosome. That's this compactation due to sequence dependence term or genomic distance term. We put these things, we build constraints. Okay, and as you build these constraints, what do we do? We put these constraints on the model for everything else I don't know into the homopolymer and we apply maximum entropy and we try to learn all the terms of our homeotonium. Okay? The good thing about maximum entropy is something we have been using in statistical physics for a long time and we have been using other, other events also. But I want to point out to people that you always have to be aware that people say, given a certain number of constraints, the best model you can get by using maximum entropy, that's probably true, but the best model may not be good enough if you don't have enough information on your constraints, right? So there's something always to be aware as, as you're using these interactions. So in a sense, what we did is we tried to learn these parameters. There are not that many of them. Basically, if you look, there are only two parameters here. There's the pen of gamma D, there's this guy, and the alpha, here in the case, we have six, but if you do just A's and B's alone, it's almost sufficient to get something there good enough for the structures. So what we do is, we do inference methods here, and we learn these parameters using the data from chromosome 10, from the lymphoblastoid, from GM1278, that is there to have this here. So why we chose chromosome 10 is because we went around the different chromosomes, and that's one that show a lot of the patterns of the different A's and B's. One of, it was a chromosome that basically, we believe there was enough information there to learn anything. Now, the beauty of it is after we learned chromosome 10, you can now apply this thing to the other chromosomes. Now, what's the difference for the other chromosome? Let me go back a little bit. Sorry, I should have that. 
The difference with other chromosomes is the same potential, just the list of A's and B's are different. But if you go on their structures, if you get just the high C data, you can go for a high C data and determine which are the patterns of A's and B's. Okay, so remember what I said. You can go from a high C data and get A's and B's. When I'm done here, I'm gonna say, I don't wanna look at high C data to a point, I just wanna look at chipsic data that determines the A's and B's. So the question here you have is, if you have the sequence of A's and B's, you can get that. But this slide tells you, this is the chromosome you taught your system, uh, you have a Pearson correlation of about, uh, as you can see, it's a Pearson correlation of about 0.99 for all these things. And you see the other chromosomes do equally well, okay? You can even joke that some of them do better than what you thought it, but you're really pushing your luck if you try to make a difference here. Okay, but tells you that this model by itself, if you have the sequences A's and B, these models are able to give equally good structures. Now, you can tell me, people, that I'm trying to fool you. With, with this data, because the Pearson correlation is a very easy task for our model, because as we learned yesterday on lots of the conversations, when you do the structure of the chromosome, different proteins, you have lots of context clues diagonal. You have this very thick diagonal, so you know that this Pearson correlation number is heavily biased by these numbers, so it doesn't provide you as, as much information as you want for a context far from the diagonal, so you have to do a little bit of further tests to figure out if you get this long distance, is, uh, this context there far in sequence, but close in space, how you get them. First thing people have done in many of these tests is the sort that there is this contact probability, that's a power law depending on genomic distance. And here I'm comparing the high C for with our simulation, and you see that you do equally well. Actually, if you look at our, our ideal chromosome, for technical reasons, we have a minor truncation into the model, and depending on where I put the truncation, you can actually see that's where this small difference appears down here. Okay, so in a sense, you can see that basically, here now you're saying things that are very far in genomic distance agree well into the model, but that's a soft test. If you want to do a harder test, a harder test is basically, you can start to have a look on what's the Pearson correlation, not of every data, but data at certain genomic distance from the diagonal, so I'm trying to get lines a certain distance d. Now, this particular test is, is even harder than it should be. I said the Pearson correlation of everything is too, is too easy. This is much harder because sometimes things may deviate a little bit and if you really force, the, but it's good to compare. And what you see here is the results. Here's genomic distance. Blue, just for comparison, we use on the entire thing. It's just I use just my homopolymer model, okay? And here's using the full model. You see that when you come down, you get Pearson correlations about 0.5. Now. Is this good or bad? I can tell you from protein folding, if you get things like that in structure, that's enough. You get the structure, you're done, because basically you have to satisfy the context together with this fact that the chain is connected, that's enough to give you a good structure. Now, if you're happy or not, it's not happy. But I can tell you one thing. You learn about yesterday a lot about noise on the data. So one thing I ask Aries, I don't know if he's here right now, one thing I ask Aries is basically, if I look your data from different days, how does it look? Here I'm comparing predictions and experiments. What happens if you compare to two experiments? And he said, oh, if you compare to the experiments in my lab, we do a little bit better. Not much better, but we do better. Say, what happens if I compare between two labs? Say, they're more or less about this amount. So in a sense, basically, we are here with the precision of the method, with the noise we have. So I think we are happy that this model <coughs> is good enough for the prediction we have here of what we want to do. So now, the problem with what we did until now, also we are getting good structures in three dimension, is that we're assuming, we're assuming that we know the A's and B's. But the idea is, but that requires me not use the full high C data, but at least use the high C data to see which parts are A and B's. But like I told you guys, what we want to do is actually predict my sequence of A's and B directly from the chip seek information. And Ryan Shank, that's here, the main guy that started to do this work. And, uh, 
And again, this I'm just you just show these slides to show why you believe this is done because there's this enormous correlation between structure and the epigenetic information. So what Ryan decided is basically, if I have a chain of DNA here, and these are all the different tracks of chip seek information, can I predict my sequence of A's, B's, A1's, A2, B1's, B2, B3, B4 directly from this chip seek information? That's what we want. So what Ryan said is, how about if I treat this as a sequence? This is just like a protein. But a protein, then now the first amino acid is the type. And all the other amino acids are the experimental information. OK? So here we have chains of, is Ryan here? How many tracks we put on there? Right, but normally we have more than 11, right? Well, then it's how many? How many are there? Yeah, there's about 150, but the bottom line, you don't need all of them. But these are things. So what means by calling that a sequence? In another complete part of our research, we have been trying to detect, detect pairs of contacts from covariance data by saying that uh, if you have a sequence and uh, they, f they form a contact, that's protein folding, OK? This data comes from covariance. And when we work this model around, we get this probability information. We can get the global probability distribution that's going to map, I don't want to tell you today, map into a POTS model, OK? And from this POTS model, we can figure out which pairs of contacts are more likely by not getting information from a single one, but forming a contact, you have covariance. So what Ryan did is the following thing. We can apply the same technique here now by saying that this is a sequence. Instead of being aligning many protein sequences, now each loci here is going to be one sequence. And now you have about, in a typical gene, on 50 kilobases per bit, we have about 2,000 loci. So you have like 2,000 sequences, and we can apply the same idea. So you can apply the same idea to say that this sequence now is now the first sequence, the first the type I'm trying to predict, and the other is the experimental information. And when I align all these sequences, again, I end up on a similar POTS model, and I have the same information where I can come up with the likelihood when I do inference of the model. So the same inference I did on the protein problem, I can do here with chip seek information. The nice thing about it, just to point out for you, I don't have time to go over all the details, is I'm not adding just information between a particular type and each experiment, but also adding the covariance between the different experiments. So when I come here, I'm actually multiplying the effect of the data by doing that. So that really creates a very powerful method. And then when you're done on obtaining my POTS Hamiltonian, very similar with the tools we use for proteins. In a sense, you can do other machine learning methods to learn from, from this data. If you prefer, you can use a vector machine, but this is a very powerful method here. What we do now, as we get this global probability distribution I told you get before, now I can collapse everything and guess what, what's the mostly maximum likelihood of type that I have for each one of these bits. So by applying this technique now, I can come for every cell line that I have some chip seek information. I can predict which are the structural types, and now I have my sequence. I can do that. So now I have a game that becomes very simple, basically. I can now, as you can see, this is a typical prediction of the types that I know you just look your eyes. And that's a prediction by megabase. And you can see we do reasonably well. Actually, much in a sense that basically our predictions, as, as we do know this model now, are as good as the one we have by using high C data. When we look at the structures, you cannot see the difference between the structures. OK, so now I have this powerful method. Like I said, for different chromosomes, I start. 
I had two learning parts to our system, okay? We had two learning parts for our system. As you notice, we had a learning part to learn the parameter of my Hamiltonian at this part, and we have a learning part to teach how looking at particular chip seek data to get. But after we learn, after we train our system, now we don't change our system anymore. Megabase, Megabase has got a structural part, train on chromosome 10 of lymph blastoid, and you use a, a few of the odd chromosomes. You cannot use only one because there's not enough information in one. Okay, but after we did that, now we move forward with, with no other information. So the question now comes, as you have these things, you predict structures. And here's just one structure to look for you. That's how they look. You can see how dynamical they are. If I just run on a typical prediction for our systems, they are not the fixed structures, right? This is just a single, how do I compare these things? So let me do a little bit of a comparison of these things. The first thing you compare these things is with the contact maps. So like I said, here are two different chromosomes. You can have the full chromosome, but you really want to look, uh, here is just, we are just uh, turning this around, so the diagonal is here to see here. But I also have to compare regions far from the diagonal, as you're seeing here, and we do very good agreement on these regions as they come along. So we're very happy with the method in terms that our three-dimensional structure is consistent with the two-dimensional high C plot. And what I call three-dimensional structure is our three-dimensional ensemble of structures. Here's a few cases, and you see the Pierce correlations are more or less the same as we got before. If you do the other comparisons, the power law dependence of the genomic probabilities, or if you look the other ones, they look very, very similar we had before. Another thing we're very curious to do, and we start to do more, now we just have preliminary results, is basically, now here we're not using high C to predict the structure, you, or you're not using high C anymore to help us, you're using high C now here at this point just to check if the structures we predict are good enough. The other thing is, compare these things to fish data. Also, fish data is not going to give you all the contacts. You, you may start to have a look on, on several of these contacts. So this information not only help us to calibrate the model distance, but help to show the situation. So how about this phase separation? This is correct. Here's just a couple of contacts. Let me show just this one for curiosity, because Denise already tell me I'm running out of time. But if you have a look, here you have a red locus, that's a locus, and two blue locus that are B kind of locus, and we are comparing here the distance to the L2, that's a blue one. Okay, and as you see, the blue ones are further apart from each other than the red is to the, to the blues. And if you look at the chip seek information, we start to observe that the distance from 3 is longer than 4. So it tells you that spatial distances are longer for L3 than 4, even so, they, they, even so L3 is shorter in sequence. And these two, so that means that the blues are getting closer to Jordan and getting to the three. And here's a comparison what was measured on fish experiment. That's what I get from our model. So clearly, this is a very ad hoc situation. We're just showing a couple of cases. We have other cases going around. But these are things that you're getting now larger quantities of data. So look at consistency between high C ensembles and fish data. I think it's going to make our life more interesting. Now, what they're doing now. Ryan is back there, he's also going to make a presentation. He has a paper that's theoretically done for the last few months. And uh, I'm going to put some data we haven't published on that yet that is actually showed that basically now, can we get these things and just go to different cells? These things were trained on this lymph blastoid cell. So if you have a few other different uh, cells, and you can just look, and you, we do quite well on these different cells. So that tells me that this model, also have been trained on lymph blastoid, you're, you feel very comfortable on taking them to do these things. Now, on the last two minutes, just to, to go fast and finish these things without uh, making uh, things going crazy, we are we're very happy with it that we have a very nice website called ndbrice.edu. It has just been created. I think you can talk to Vinicius. Vinicius is here, back there. He has a poster, what he can tell you about it. Basically, here we have all the information of encode is there. For most of these things, we have the ensemble of structures there in there, but you can put your own structure and get your ensemble things. You can get the, the three-dimensional picture. 
So we are trying to make these things like, as you can see here, you can run, run megabase and microm, you can visualize and analyze 3D ensembles, you can browse the data of uh, 22 mega 3D structure from eight cell lines that were there. Okay, so these are things that was there. So my first two, three minutes just to finish, I'm going to show you a couple figures that says, now when you look at these ensembles, we don't have one minute, but I'm just going to throw, fly through a few slides just for curiosity. This is basically what you get if you get a typical structure. So the cool part is, as expect, things phase separate. Okay, if you look here, here's homopolymer, here's my system. You can see the size of clusters. The B clusters are even larger than the A clusters, so you have phase separation of A and B. Okay? The second part is the A's that tend to be the most gene active. They are more on the surface than the B's. As expected, as we have seen on all the figures, these also agree with experiments. The third part is when I do a simulation of two chromosomes, the two chromosomes separate between themselves. We know our model was never trained for two chromosomes, but here is just put 17 and 18. To try to simulate the entire nucleus is a very important thing here. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to flash these slides over you. Here is highly expressed genes tend to co-localize. This is all predicted prementally. That comes from simulation. And finally, I will finish with this slide here is these systems compared to homopolymer have much less knots than the system, basically. Instead of using Alexander polynomial, there's an idea that since Sasha Grossberg came with it, what he called the minimal rope length. Several people claim other people did, but I learned from his papers. That's a very useful technique that you get the entire, the entire polymer and you try to compact it as much as you can. And uh, if you don't have any knots, you can come to some things that don't like. But if you have knots, you follow these structures. So this can, it's a nice measure, this minimal rope length of the knots that you have. So with that, I want to finish here. I want to thank you guys. I think there is a few areas to be discussed. I'm going to leave this slide here. This is just a cartoon slide to show that basically there are alternative pictures to go to a signal making no knots. I see there's the idea that was proposed about the fractal globule. But uh, the nice thing about Micron the microns, you have a little bit of stresses. Even if you start from a, from a knot structure, you tend to, to the system is going to equilibrate on these sort of very low knot structures. On its own, that's an equilibrium is, is situation for this problem. Okay, with that, Denise, and being 1.30 seconds late, I finish. So, uh, time for a few questions. TJ. Uh, really, really nice. Uh, Jose. So I have uh, uh, two questions. One is just a curiosity: uh, why you uh, do not use a DNA methylation as uh, input? Uh, second, no, no. Uh, we do. It comes on chip seek information. There is the DNA methylation. All the chip seek information has all the methylation, acetylation, all the epigenetic exchanges. Not beyond. Actually, we we can add many many different inputs. That's what comes on chip seek information. But chip seek does not give you DNA methylation. Sure, yes. Oh, DNA methylation, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, the interesting question is the following. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm too early. Uh, uh -huh. I got, DNA methylation may be important, but what we learn is that chip seek information is enough. So there's a, a redundant, okay? so redundancy there. So if you have six there, types, yeah. all you need is enough information mm -hmm. to separate the six mm -hmm. types. Doesn't mean other things are not important, but if you believe mm -hmm. that you can fall into these two types and six subtypes, all you need is enough information to be able to figure out if your bid belongs to one of these different classes. Mm -hmm. and, and actually here, just, just uh, methylation and acetylation of, uh, of histones is enough to, predict, to do this information and agree with experiments. Now, you could use more information. We don't, but the chips information, they one mostly available. If you go out there on ENCODE, the information is available for all these things. This DNA methylation is not as, as available as everything I else. So, so it's really a combination of... Uh, What's the minimum you need and what's more available? And even more, is this data consistent in a way that people can use it mm -hmm. without going crazy? Mm -hmm. So the second question is that the, your uh, high C prediction uh, starts from about 50 uh, kilobase scale, but uh, I guess chip seek data is available at a higher resolution. And now there are new uh, new uh, genome, whatever, some new kinds of data, micro C, that gives you higher resolution information. So I, I think it'll be interesting to see whether 
your model can also that's, uh, that's a very that's a very very interesting question the question you are asking is a very interesting question and peter is very critical of that the question is why do we live with six types are these types real or is this just a convenient uh, tool and if i go from 50 kilobases to five kilobases do i have more types it uh, appears you don't need more types, but that's something that remains to be seen. We start to look at models on more details. And uh, the second part that comes with that is that at least uh, what you observe is if you look at the chip seek information, people are glad to say there were about six, anything from five to ten types. So people from the structural side came to a similar number of types that came from chip seek. But it's very interesting in structure to see if there's something fundamental about. Uh, about this type not, or if this is just a, a something that happens on that resolution. So we are doing models on, on, on lower resolution. I think everybody's moving on something. There are people working at the nucleosome scale. There are people working like we do on 50 kilo bases. You, I think Andy was telling about trying to go to lower intermediate dimensions. Say every people is moving towards that interval and see what happens. Question from the left, and one question here. We'll take those two questions while Richard's setting up. Thank you. It's very really interesting to do this. Thank you very much. Uh, I have two questions. One is technical. You have this translation from probability of contact to distribution of distance. And this seems to be something that in the Binto and Company paper was measured. So my question is whether you are as assumed probability distribution of distances is in agreement with measured one. Yes, the, our FIJ came from experiments, so we are just basic, so we haven't created that from anywhere, and that's basically, that's how we calibrate your model. As shown in the beginning, we have to put a contact. Now, the question we are asking, we are using a, a single number, in a sense, right? You're using FIJ right, something yeah. at a distance where our bid is about 0.16 right, uh, micrometers. Yeah. And the, the question is, is there some heterogeneity on that number? That's a good question. We are working with a fixed number for that. Okay. Uh, but this is technical. More ideological question is, is the following. You introduce this gamma of D, which is sort of a spooky action on the distances, some people call it. You introduce it by hand, and then you consider equilibrium statistical mechanics. You must have thought about what could be the physical uh, mechanism behind your gamma of D. Okay. And specific question about it is the following. Do you believe that the system, in the reality, there is some gamma of D, there is some distance, okay. but do you believe that real system obeys detailed bounds? Okay, that's a, that's a very excellent question. I'm going to give you a short answer. You're going to get a long answer from Peter this afternoon because he's going to talk about this with heart. That's something actually we adopt from what he did, so I think since he's the father of this child, I let him defend the I will tell this story. Uh, our model, in our model, in our model, the way we present for you today, we are very agnostic about the origin of gamma of D. In a sense, uh, we just assume. Oh, wait, 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 I'm finished. You asked the question, I'll have to let me finish the answer. So now, the second part is, can we fit this gamma of D into a sort of what we call an equilibrium model or in a thermodynamic model, when you know that this gamma of D probably is not thermodynamic, probably the things done by extrusion and motors and other things like that. So that's a very interesting question. You know there are many cases you can have an effect thermodynamic model, even in a lower dimension, you may have a non-equilibrium system, and that comes in an effective way, and that's the way we treat. But the real physical origin of it, I think we're going to really have to understand the mechanism, and we're trying to work on some physical mechanism for that. We have a few papers on that. But I think that we can live at this dimension, at the 50 kilo basis scale, at least we can live with this gamma of D in a sense of a way of reproducing the data. So in a way, it's a good way because we sort of try to say we need that term and you have this local information. That's why we give the Fed diagonal into this sort of as a Hamiltonian model. This but sounds, the origin of it may be... This well. sounds like the kind of information that should, a uh, discussion that should follow on okay, we continue. Uh, we <laughs> during the coffee break. So very quick here from the front and uh, then we will start the next. Very quick, please. Very good. Uh, this is really cool. Uh, and. When, when something works as well, I just want to push it a little bit further. Uh, so your, your polymer, you have single configurations, and you've trained it on a multiple cell high C uh, data set. Can you, do you think you can make predictions, accurate predictions from your model, what should happen in a single cell high C to be re verified when 
those get better. Okay, uh, I'll give you I'll give you two answers to that. The answer is in principle yes. Okay, and we have had a look on single cell high C. The problem with single cell high C now you're you don't have real good data order in, the, in megabase resolution. Now, there's an interesting number that's good for you to keep in mind when you do this comp. So everything in principle is yes, but it's to keep in mind is if you have the current data that Aries show you and you see how many contacts they measure and you try to do a calculation yourself, I did myself, no one give this number in a direct way, you're going to see that each bid with another bid is going to have on average anything between three to five contacts. Okay, so if you start to do single cell high C, the question is, do you have enough contacts to get? That's the problem of going to higher resolution single cell high C. But in, in principle, that would be interesting to observe, particularly if you could observe the dynamics of single cell high C and see if that represents the ensemble you have. Or if you did, mul I think if you did multiple single cell high Cs at a higher resolution, you shouldn't find a single structure. You should find the signature of an ensemble of structures, right? So these are very open questions, not solved yet, but I think the answer is yes, and it'll be very interesting to be done. All right, quick yes or no answers yes. Let's move on, please. <laughs>